Please rise. We're going to try to do one verse of our opening hymn. She's a sinner, so I be. She's a shed his blood for me. Died that I might live on high. Lives that I might never die. As the branches to and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Before the most blessed and eternal Trinity, let us acknowledge together that we are sinners in need of divine mercy and forgiveness. O oh, Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the Word, announce the grace of God unto all of you, and in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you have given us grace to acknowledge the glory of the eternal Trinity by the confession of a true faith and to worship the unity in the power of the divine majesty. Keep us steadfast in this faith and defend us from all adversities. For you, O Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, live and reign one God now, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for readings from sacred scripture. And this first reading, I, I have to confess to you that I have cheated. I have cheated. Normally there is a schedule of readings that I adhere to strictly. But for the purposes of my comments tonight, I decided to use a selection of my own choosing, which is from 2 Peter. So I'll explain in my sermon why I did that. So this is from St. Peter of Galilee, his second epistle. Simon Peter, a servant and apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have, who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. 
For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue, and virtue with knowledge, and knowledge with self-control, and self-control with steadfastness, and steadfastness with godliness, and godliness with brotherly affection, and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is the word of the Lord. And our gospel selection for this evening, which actually is the properly scheduled one, so my cheating ends here. This is actually what is scheduled for tonight. The Holy Gospel is taken from uh, St. Matthew, chapter 28. So we are at the very end of the Gospel of Matthew. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore... And make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, to the end of the age. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord. Now I invite you to please rise for the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, Maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only God, Son of God, begotten of His Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God, very God, begotten not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the Scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand and he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated, and if you don't mind, have your sermon handout ready. I have a list of some really great high pollutant words. They're each worth about $15. So. <laughs> There's one other word that I was thinking about putting on the list. I, I'm still kind of torn. Maybe I'll do it for the congregations tomorrow. But uh, I was thinking SpaceX. Can you imagine how I might incorporate SpaceX into a sermon about the Trinity? Oh, it's floating around in my mind. Uh, but real quickly, let's go through this list. In fact, uh, why don't you repeat them after me, okay? The first word is a Greek word. It's perichoresis. The next is the Latin version of that same term, uh, circumcision. Circumcision. Round. Round. Choreography. Choreography. Rotation. 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 Communication. Communication. Essence. Essence. Oneness. Oneness. Radiance. Radiance. Spiration. 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 Modalism. Modalism. Appropriation. Weddings, partakers. Do you think? Let's do it. SpaceX. Do you think I can do it? Do you think I can come up with a sermon, relatively short, and incorporate all these terms? Okay, I'm going to try. Now, I don't know to what extent I'll be able to do it in order, but I'm going to try to do it in order. 
Okay, so this is the Sunday after the Feast of Pentecost, which means it is the Feast of the Holy Trinity. Okay, that's just a great liturgical tradition that hopefully will always be true in throughout Christian history until the Second Coming. Okay, so I want to introduce you to a term that pertains to the Holy Trinity. It's very, very ancient, um, but it was... Uh, a term applied by some of the church's greatest theologians in an effort to understand or to theologically grapple with the nature of the Trinity. God is three persons, but he is one divine essence. So this great word was introduced in the Christian theology, perichoresis, okay? And the Latin term for perichoresis is circumcession. Okay, they basically mean kind of the same thing. If you break the word down, para is round, okay, like you can imagine a perimeter. And choresis is where we get the word choreography. Okay, so let me try to explain the concept of parachoresis. Parachoresis is this idea that the three persons of the Holy Trinity don't just stand there and look at each other. But they are involved in constant divine activity or rotation. Uh, Paris is actually literally translated, that's where we get the word choreography, but literally translated, it means to sort of make room for the other. So you can see how it's, it's, it's a term that would apply to a kind of dancing, you know, sort of like in those old Jane Austen movies where you had the very formal dances at the balls where all those characters would go. There were certain steps that they would take, and by doing so, they would make room for their partner. Well, this is a divine activity by which the three persons that are God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, make room for one another in a kind of constant and eternal rotation that is totally non-static, but full of life and divine activity, okay? And in so doing, they achieve a kind of perfect communication that we are not able to achieve in this world. That's one of the, the things about our flawed nature. Uh, even when it comes to our best friends, even when it comes to members of our family, even when it comes to our colleagues, we may be able to communicate very, very well and effectively with each other, but we are not able to communicate perfectly and flawlessly. No matter what I say to that person who is closest to me, say my wife. By the way, we celebrated 15 years uh, on Friday. Friday, we celebrated 15 years. 15 years of good, quality, non-perfect communication. Okay? Thursday. Okay, Thursday was our anniversary. <laughs> June 4th. I remember the date. It's not the day of the week. Okay, so when perfect communication is achieved, then the result is oneness. Okay? Now, Monique and I are two people. Uh, Steve is the head elder. The head elder and the pastor, we are in constant communication with each other. We will never completely communicate perfectly in this life because of our flawed, sinful nature, but we can come very, very close. But still, we don't have that perfection of oneness. But in the divine trinity between the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, they communicate so perfectly and so flawlessly with each other that there exists between them a singular essence which is divine and eternal and unchanging. Okay? So they are there are three distinct persons though, and if, if you want a great $15 theological term, you can refer to the doctrine of appropriation. The doctrine of appropriations is the idea that each person of the Holy Trinity executes a kind of function that pertains to us as their creation. So traditionally, it's very easy for us to say that the Father creates. And then, of course, we refer to the Son who redeems. 
And then we refer to the Holy Spirit who sanctifies us, okay? None of us would ever say that the Father died on the cross. None of us would ever say that the Holy Spirit died on the cross. But that is what we say about Jesus, whom we refer to as the second person of the Holy Trinity. Also, when we talk about the conception of Jesus in the womb of the Virgin, we always refer to that as the work of the Holy Spirit. See? So the doctrine of appropriation sustains the distinctions between each person of the Holy Trinity. You have the Father, sometimes referred to as the unoriginal, originating origin. Have you ever heard that before? And then you have the Son who is eternally begotten of the Father. Now look at this handout. Do you see that I have a picture of a candle? It's not just a picture of a candle. It's also a depiction of the light that radiates from a candle flame. Okay? So a few minutes ago in our Nicene Creed, we confessed that Jesus is God from God, true light from light. He's light from light, true God from true God. Now imagine a flame. Okay, say in a dark room like this candle right here. Okay, it's in a perfectly dark room, but you can see this flame. What you cannot imagine is a flame that doesn't radiate light. Okay, so imagine a flame that has no beginning. It's just always been lit. If there is no official date of its start, it's just always been there. So think of that flame as the Father. And think of the radiance of that flame, the light that it generates as the sun. That's what is meant in the Nicene Creed when we talk about Jesus as light from light, true God from true God. The sun is the radiance of the Father. The Holy Spirit spirates. Now think about that word spirit and how it's related to words like respiratory. It has to do with breathing, right? Breath. The Hebrew word for spirit is ruah. If you put your hand in front of your face when you say the Hebrew word for spirit, ruah, you can actually feel the breath coming out of you. St. Augustine referred to the Trinity in this way, that the Father is the speaker, the Son is the word that is spoken, and the Holy Spirit is the breath by which that word is spoken. Now let me tell you what we're not. We're Christians. Yes, we are. We're Christian. We, we love being Christian. We cherish the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But let me tell you what we're not. We're not modalists. You see that word modalism? I hate that word. It caused me pain typing that for you this evening. That's how much I hate that word. It's a heresy. It's the idea that God is one person who reveals himself in three different modes. We would never believe that. So cross that ugly word out and never give your breath to it because we hate modalism. We're not, we're not modalists. We don't believe that God is just one person who reveals himself in three different modes. But God's word reveals to us that God is three persons eternally united in one divine essence. But I put it on there so that you would know and so that you would not make that mistake. Okay? Now, let's talk about weddings. Alright? What are some things that people do after the wedding ceremony? They go to the hall, right? There's a buffet. There's either a DJ or a band. We had a DJ, right? And then what do people do? Look at that picture at the top. Now that, when I typed in on Google perichoresis, I wanted an image for perichoresis. And that's one of the images that came up. You see you have three entities there involved in an eternal rotation or dance together. Which again is sort of the ancient understanding of how the three persons relate to one another. They make room for each other, communicate perfectly with each other in such a way that there is a divine oneness that exists between them, but it is not static, but it is ever-moving 
ever rotating in a constant and eternal divine activity. Okay? So think about this. You're that person at the wedding. That you just, you're not into it. You, you don't want to dance. All right? There are certain things that you might like about a wedding reception, the meal, the open bar, whatever. You're not getting out on the dance floor. But you know how they do. They start to form a circle. They're holding hands. They're moving around. It's jovial. It's fun. And then somebody, an aunt or a cousin, who you get so mad at that person because he or she, they try to pull you in, right? <laughs> And you're embarrassed and awkward because you just don't have the moves. I don't have the moves. I do not dance well. I don't like to dance. And I get very annoyed when somebody tries to pull me into it. But this is what I want you to understand, okay? You are being pulled into the divine dance of the Holy Trinity. That's why I put in that selection from 2 Peter. Because he says there... And with crystal clarity, he says, do you understand who you are? You are being made partakers of the divine nature. This is where SpaceX comes in. Because I'm looking at those astronauts, and I'm kind of jealous of them, because here on planet Earth, it's total chaos. But they're up there where it's peaceful. <laughs> well, even though things have gotten kind of rowdy on planet Earth, and we all feel anxious and nervous about things that are happening around us, I want you to be encouraged that for all of eternity, we will be in a much different kind of setting. We will share in the glory of God. We will be made, as St. Peter of Galilee says in his second epistle, partakers of the divine nature. We are being pulled, even if we sometimes don't agree. But by God's grace, by His mercy, by His, His, His saving invitation, He is pulling us in to His own divine life, which is much different from the sinful world to which we were born, and much different from what we are experiencing lately, I can assure you. It will be an eternity of perfect joy and ecstasy as we participate in the perichoresis of God, the divine, everlasting activity that is Him. And that's what I want you to understand about communion and the sacraments and God's Word. All of these things are just like that cousin or that aunt at the wedding grabbing us by the hand and pulling us in to God's own divine life. That's what it means to be Christian. That's why every year we must remember what it means to believe in the Trinity. Amen. Now, please rise for the prayer of the church. I think it's appropriate that we should pray for peace in the world. Let us take just a moment of silence to collect our thoughts and to think about what we've been seeing in the world and how we just want God to bless us with His incredible calm and peace. Heavenly Father, God of all concord, it is your gracious will that your children on earth live together in harmony and peace. Defeat the plans of all those who would stir up violence and strife. Destroy the weapons of those who delight in war and bloodshed. And according to your will, end all conflicts in the world. Teach us to examine our hearts that we may recognize our own inclination toward envy, malice, hatred, and enmity. Help us by your word and spirit to search our hearts and to root out the evil that would lead to strife and discord, so that in our lives we may be at peace with all people. 
Fill us with zeal for the work of your church and the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ, which alone can bring that peace which is beyond all understanding through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. It is truly neat, right, and salutary that we should at all times and in all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, who with your only begotten Son and the Holy Spirit are one God, one Lord. In the confession of the only true God, we worship the Trinity in person and the unity in substance of majesty co-equal. Hear us as we pray as Jesus our Lord taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen. And now I invite you all to eat and to drink the true body of our Lord and Savior and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, broken, shed, and given into death for the remission of all your sins. You may be seated. Please rise. And now may this, the true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, keep you steadfast in the true faith. And may Almighty God bless you. May He protect you from all that is evil and grant to you His everlasting life, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. I'm looking at that clock and I'm thinking, yeah. When I don't have a written test, text, it's dangerous. <laughs> it's just dangerous when I don't have it all written out. But it's a lot more fun to do it this other way. All right, I think we can do this. Okay, I think we can. Let me try. Oh, Lord, this